so thank you guys for joining. It must be in the evening time where you are. It, it's like midday where I am. And today's or this evening's session for you guys will be talking all about using Microsoft Azure with machine learning and devices to detect data within those devices and be able to use those detections and those patterns of data that you may be looking for inside of your applications in order to do all kind of cool and fancy things. And I'll talk a little bit about what those cool and fancy things are toward the end of this session. But let's kind of get started with a little bit about me and my background who I am. So my name is Dwight Goins. I am ex-Microsoft Integration MVP um, back in the day. Uh, 2006 and 2009 and R2, and I have recently moved over to the Connect for Windows area, and Connect for Windows spaces or devices, and, word. and now I spend my time integrating, lack of a better word, integrating with embedded devices, integrating with natural user interface type of devices, such as the Connect for Windows device that you can find with the Xbox One. So. This evening, what I'd like to spend some time talking about is five reasons why you really want to think about utilizing Azure Machine Learning with devices and the Internet of Things, what that buzzword is all about and why that's important for you in the integration space. The need for processing data, machine learning and an overview of the different algorithms that exist and how you would go about implementing those different algorithms inside your code if you needed to do so. And then we'll talk about Microsoft Azure Machine Learning and how it kind of makes life a heck of a lot easier when developing applications that utilize machine learning techniques and then we'll talk about devices and the data that comes from devices such as the connect I'll show you the different types of feeds that come from the connect as a typical type of device that you might find uh, in the industry or inside of the enterprise for doing various different things and we'll talk about how to take that data and manipulate it with Azure machine learning and be able to use that within custom .NET based applications to again make some cool things come to life so let's get started sure and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to hold them toward the end of the session, and I'll try and answer them toward the end because it's going to be... says I am not muted. It's back now. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, I think it was. It just went all crackly for a while. I think maybe your internet was acting up a little bit, mate. Okay, no worries. Well, I, think, I think we missed me... about, the, about the last minute of what you said. I think we missed, but I assume it was just a temporary internet thing. Yes. Um, so the last minute I was saying basically um, with the agenda, we'd like to go into the first five reasons as to why you may want to use Azure Machine Learning to detect patterns of data from different devices. Um, so one of the first main reasons is obviously the main topic of the course, um, recognizing data patterns. You have, and the example is, let's say you need to integrate with some physical device. And the obvious statement of that, here's an example that happened to me not too long ago. So I was in an elevator, and the elevator had kind of, was making kind of weird noises and you know, it was it was acting funny, and my wife was in the elevator with me, and she was getting kind of scared, and she was like, what's going on in this elevator? And I'm like, I don't know. So we went to the front desk of the hotel lobby and told them, hey, can you check out this elevator? It's kind of making some weird noises, uh, and, you know, it, it could be going out, but, you know, it's just acting funny. 
and later on that evening when we came back into the hotel, they, we saw a repairman actually, you know, looking at that particular elevator as we're going up the, the adjacent elevator. And I was thinking to myself, I said, hey, wouldn't it be unique if there were a way in which a repairman could immediately determine or predetermine if different parts of the elevator were going out prior to myself, a client of the hotel, having to come and tell the hotel, hey, this elevator is going out. Well, you could do those type of things, but you would have to recognize sounds. You would have to recognize events. You would have to recognize when different components of that device is behaving abnormally. So that would be one reason to do something like this, to recognize, number one, a standard set of data patterns that are happening all the time, and then recognize when an abnormal event was happening. So yes, machine learning gives you that capability. What about predicting actions and events? Well, if you ever had the need to have a report, let's say you have a report of a bunch of data, and there are various different fields within that data that you would like to summarize on, and you want to take a guess, you want to, you want to forecast in the future what's going to happen if that particular field or that particular data um, is going to go up or it's going to go down or it's going to become null or something to that effect. Well, if that were the case, you have the ability of predicting that information, again, with machine learning. What if you wanted to determine if a group of data was in the same group or if it was close or similar to the same group? And we'll go into some of the algorithms that are used in just a minute, but if you needed to do something like that, if you needed to determine, you know, if a person lives in a particular area and that area has a high crime rate, you want to figure out what makes that area a high crime rate. Are there a lot of liquor stores or alcohol stores next to that area? Are there, you know, a lot of um, police stations maybe next to that area? Are there, you know, you know, low-income housing next to that area, things of that nature um, will help you classify and group similar data together to help you determine these type of things. Another similar idea is what if you had a website, a website that you were working on or a web application, and that web application had a searching capability similar to what we call Google and Bing. And within that website, you want to be able to search content and you want to be able to figure out how many users are searching the same type of terms and rank those terms. And so because if a lot of users are searching, you know, the latest events such as the, the banks in Greece closing, right, and you want to search that information, you want to pull up the most relevant researches and most relevant links and information about that topic and pull them up at the top of your screen. Well, you can do that with machine learning as well. And as a matter of fact, Google uses machine learning to do things of that nature. Or what if you have this unique idea where you have all, all of these components that exist because you're that, you know, you're that Radio Shack hacker, you are that guy that has the garage that has all of these components from broken apart from radio devices to, you know, wave analyzers to, you know, maybe you just wanted to put your home air conditioning unit on Azure and you just wanted to figure out if it was possible for you to do so and you wanted to experiment with these different ideas. Could you do that? You sure could with Azure Machine Learning. So when we talk about IoT, IoT stands for the Internet of Things. It is the buzzword. It is the new age of how we envision connected devices. So I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard about and mentioning or in passing about the whole Windows 10 initiative and how we as you know, Microsoft developers need to get on board fairly quickly and get ramped up the speed. And one of those major key components of Windows 10 is the ability to work with devices. Now without relieving, you know, without diverging too much information, knowing a little bit about devices that can be connected to the internet, hence the term cloud devices, you have the ability of connecting those devices up to Azure and reading information that comes from those devices. You can read telemetry data, you can read uh, events that may come from that data, you can read 
anything that that device generates, that's information. And if you can read that information, you can gather it and start doing reports on it, and eventually you can even do analysis on it. So the Internet of Things is very important. So that takes us into the need for processing data. So now that we know we can connect these devices, and you can connect devices that have Internet capabilities, and you can also connect devices that do not have Internet capability. The way in which you can do that is, of course, you have to go into the hardwired devices and figure out ways in which you can read the events that are coming off of that data and send it to a proxy or send it to a computer or send it to some component that gives you the ability of you know, sending that data through the Internet. But once we have these devices connected to the cloud in some form or fashion, we can read the data. And it's very important for us because going back to the example of the elevator, it would be great if we can predict when elevator components are going out. As a matter of fact, we had a potential project not too long ago um, that we had a client that sells vending machines. And the client realized that there are, uh, there's a lot of money wasted in sending repairmen out to go to vending machines to collect money, when things to replenish you know, the items inside the vending machines, to go and sort of do maintenance on those vending machines. There's a lot of money wasted because a lot of times drivers stop at vending machines when they don't really know if that vending machine needs a particular item or if a particular item is broken and so on and so forth. So if there were a way that that machine could send data back to the main office or to the local maintenance repairman or serviceman in the area, that would save them gas, it would save them time, which in essence saves money to the company selling that particular product within that vending machine. All of those things are things being worked on today and can be done and is done with machine learning. So what is this machine learning concept? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a computer going to school, getting degrees, and basically reading a bunch of books. That's not the idea of machine learning. Machine learning really is a way that you take existing data and you apply mathematical algorithms and science algorithms to this existing data to discover new patterns of data to predict where that trend of data is going or just to figure out hidden information about the data. All of these are different things that we can do. So, But it always starts with data. It always starts with an Excel spreadsheet or a tabular file or a database that has records and records of information. Sometimes that information is numerical, sometimes that information is characters, sometimes it's a mixture of characters and numbers, sometimes it's dates, right? If you could think of this database that has a ton, tons of rows and records and tons of columns, you can feed that in to various different mathematical algorithms and various different scientific approaches in order to, again, and detect patterns, to discover new information, or to predict information. There are many approaches in how we utilize machine learning. Well, actually, let me go back for a second. Let me give you another more technical overview here of machine learning, just to kind of clear up a little bit of things. I've been kind of going over this course quite a few times, or this pres presentation quite a few times. I've actually presented a version of this during the, the um, North America Microsoft Most Valuable Professional Virtual Conference that we had about a month ago. And that session is online, and uh, I'll give you the link to that session. And I saw a lot of questions. People are still kind of confused as to, you know, you know, where machine learning fits into the overall scheme of things. Machine learning is the ability for you to teach a computer how to analyze the data. And once you figure out that analytical process, you could save that analyzed process. And once that process has been saved, you could run it over and over and over again 
with new pieces of data in order to predict, in order to discover, in order to rank, in order to cluster and patternize, you name it. So to give it even more simpler terms, imagine you have some data that you want to apply a mathematical algorithm to, but you don't really know all the coefficients, all the numbers in order to make the mathematical algorithm complete, in order to get that final result, that final number. Well, machine learning is just that. It is determining what those unique coefficients are in order to get the result that you're looking for. In machine learning, we have two forms. We have two types. We have supervised learning and we have unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is the simple concept where we start with some previous data that has the output that we expect. And we teach the computer, we teach the algorithm by running the previous data against the output we expect and the computer mathematical algorithms figure out what all the coefficients are. In unsupervised learning, we don't have previous data, which means that we don't really have a way to teach coefficients to determine the output. So in unsupervised learning, typically what we do unsupervised is we run unknown data that we get at runtime into one or more algorithms to figure out what type of algorithms that it matches. In other words, to figure out what patterns it could be close to. So there are two different sides of the coin here. One is when you know the output and you have history to determine what that output is, so with new data coming in, predict what the outcome is going to be. And the other side is we don't have any history, this is brand and new, we want to figure out with all of this data we're receiving, does it look like anything that exists? Right? And that's kind of the approaches that we have. So let's get a little bit more technical into the different types of approaches that machine learning covers because there's many different algorithms and many different approaches. The first approach we have is what we refer to as the lazy learner approach. And this is the idea that we're going to get a bunch of records in and take a, you know, and this is supervised learning. We're going to take a bunch of records and we're going to look at the output. And then what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and figure out out of all the columns of data, which columns seem to be the closest in values or the closest in behavior. And the easy example that I like to explain here is think about how scientists determined if a tomato was a fruit or a vegetable. The way they determine this, actually, they use machine learning to figure this out, and they use the K &M, one of the K&M type of algorithms that exist. And what they did was they took a look at all the characteristics of a fruit and all the characteristics of a vegetable, and they said things like, hey, take a look at a carrot. How crunchy is a carrot? How sweet is a carrot? How liquidy is a carrot? Um, how much bitterness? does a carrot have? And they ranked it on a scale of 1 to 10. And they applied it against, like, let's say, a green pepper, and they applied it against the spinach, and they applied it against an orange and an apple, and they applied it against nuts. And when they applied it against all of these different things, they came up with a number at the end of this process. And they said, okay, so where does the tomato fit with this one number once they calculated all of the columns and, and added them all up? And they said, where does this tomato closest resemble? Does it resemble all the numbers that match a vegetable or all the numbers that match a fruit? And from that is where you get the nearest neighbor idea. The next approach we have is probabilistic learning. And probabilistic learning is all about this idea of probability. So if you are a mathematician and you've done statistics and you've taken that in college, that's what this approach is all about. So I'm sure you've seen whether people get up online and when they go online, they basically predict or they attempt to predict what the weather is going to look like. 
and the way in which they do that is they use probabilities. And let's say they have an almanac that has the past hundred years of rain information for the current city that you live in. What they'll do is they'll take a look at all of the past a hundred years of weather data for the city in which you live in on today's date around the particular time that you have and they'll take a look at the barometric pressure, pressure they'll take a look at the sun, the UV index, they'll take a look at all of the, the atmospheric metrics that exist and they'll say a hundred years ago today it rained, 99 years ago today it rained and they'll say 70 out of the hundred years ago on this date with these numbers it rained. So they took the probability so what they'll say is they'll go out and the weather forecast will say there's a 70% chance of rain. Why? Because 70 years ago, out of the 100 years that passed, on the day like today, when the numbers are this and the barometric pressure is this, it rains. So there's a 70% chance of rain. And that's what probabilistic learning is all about. So the algorithm technically that they use there is a naive Bayes algorithm, which is an algorithm that basically takes um, the column data that you have, which you know could, which is typically numeric or it's typically a count of something, or I'm I'm sorry, it's not typically numeric. It's typically a count of something that allows you to get probabilities of why out of so many chance, out of so much data, this item is likely to be X, Y, and Z. Decision trees. Decision trees are exactly what you think of them like inside of your coding world. They are ways in which you can apply many if expressions or many rules to your to your data. So if you can envision a table or a spreadsheet that has again a bunch of columns and a bunch of records that have things such as height with, um, and I'm just giving you some features or characteristics that you may be paying attention to, um, width in meters, length in meters, height in meters, and, and so on and so forth. And one of the common designs of decision trees, or one of the common examples of decision trees is medical diagnosis or loan approvals. It's the ability of saying, okay, based off of previous data, again, a supervised learning technique, what we can do is, based off of the person's salary, the person's length of their job, how many bank accounts that they have open, what the balances of their bank accounts are, um, what type of uh, debt that they owe currently, right? And they come up with these different ratios. And based off of this ratio pattern that they use, they can determine, based off the output of that, when the previous last 100 applicants applied and got denied, what the rules were. For example, if a person only has been at the job for less than six months and they make 25, you know, thousand a year and they want a loan for $100,000, then deny them. And so what ha happens is that if logic that exists winds up being the decision tree. So if anybody's ever done binary searching or remember taking that in college, it's the same concept. It's a binary decision tree that gets executed. And the cool thing about these decision trees, especially when you work with them in machine learning, is that for auditing purposes, you can actually see what the rules were. You can actually see the if and else conditions. And without going into too deep a level of how the algorithms determine what to what columns and what values to divide from. Um, it's really unique because you can actually see the values and you can vote on the values and you can kind of get some really cool insight into how the algorithm determine various different yes and false conditions, on and off conditions. The next approach that we have is regression models. Now regression models is used specifically with numeric data. So if you have a table of records and that record has multiple columns that have a mixture of numeric data and, and character data or string data, you're going to have to figure out a way of how to represent that string data as numbers. And that might mean, you know, 
creating a enumeration where you know each particular value you see represents a number or again you can get creative but you just kind of need to figure out a way to convert that in, into a numerical number and you typically want to keep that number normalized between 0 and 1 and the reason why is just because of how the algorithms work so the way regression models work is again supervised learning approach we have historical data and we have the output so for each record we know what the output is for a set of data that we use and what we do is we send that into a mathematical algorithm that kind of makes a, a 2d map of your data and what it tries to do is it tries to find a fitting line to that data um, by just kind of you know working with what we refer to as the uh, root mean squared error where what they do is they take a look at the data and they make a bunch of they basically use the slope um, form theorem and they try and say give me the smallest error out of a slope line that goes through all of this data and the smallest error is going to be the regression model line and if you remember anything about the slope form theorem right y equals mx plus b that concept um, we're always searching for um, you know the we're, we have the y and the x and what we are looking for is the plus b and the M. And so that's what the regression models tend to do. And that's a linear regression model. We also have um, we also have uh, curved regression models, but that's a look that's way more complex, but it uses the same pattern. It tries to figure out if you push that data on a 2D plot, right, all the records, all the information, each column of data on a 2D plot, you're trying to figure out what line can best mimic or interpret that information. So naturally, if we have a line of data, and in and, and the example that I give here, a real life scenario is in America, um, recently our last NASA, well not the last one, but the next to last space shuttle, space shuttle launch failed, um, or the, one of the major ones failed back in the 1980s. And reason they found for that failure had to do with something called the, the O-rings. The O-rings are the plastic metallic sealing that seals the different booster uh, engines together and it seals off the fuel from um, the fire, you know, when the, the rockets are blasting off. What the scientists had found out, and this is kind of a sad but true story, scientists had found out that those sealing rings they behave very well in upper temperature, which is kind of what this picture is representing here, when it was 70 and 80 degrees um, American temperature. The ceiling rings had zero failures. But when the temperatures went down to 60 degrees and 50 degrees, two or more of the ceiling rings would actually fail. So if any one ceiling ring fails, there's a catastrophic potential, right? There's potential for something blowing up, which sadly to say the Space Shuttle Challenger, it did actually explode and all the astronauts lost, lost their life. They didn't think about using this regression model because machine learning wasn't around, or it was around back then, but it wasn't popular. It wasn't, you know, you, you couldn't really take this to the politicians and say, here, using these mathematical formulas, we can predict that, um, you know, if the temperature is 30 degrees, then we're going to have probably four or five rings fill, and that's going to be really, really bad. Because if we could have used this regression model, you could just kind of follow the blue line here, and you could see, because during that launch, the temperature was like 30 degrees. So, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So, when you see that, what happens is you can kind of predict where that number would be. That number is probably going to be up here in the three or four range. So the circles representing again the number of failures that occurred in the O-rings, right? So if they could predict that. They can kind of take a guess. Well, this is a bad day to launch. It's so cold. We're predicting that these rings may absolutely fail. So again, regression models is good because you can kind of put a linear approach to it, but they also have um, parabolic approaches to regression models as well. We also have the neural network. Now this is what we refer to as the black box of machine learning approaches because there isn't a real clear concise picture of exactly what goes on 
underneath the hood. It's modeled after the brain, hence the term neural network, because of how the brain works. So if you think about the brain, the brain has neurons and it has, has these little antennas, I like to say, extending from the neurons. And these little antennas or these little, um, you know, veins like that extend actually send electrical pulses to one another that send the data back up to the to the next neuron. And it's possible that they have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Hence a neural network is, works the same way. It has multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So the idea being is that you can send in multiple inputs of data and you can have one output or multiple outputs of data that come from that neural network. And based off of the neural network design, within the neuron or within the, the main component of the neural network, there are different type of algorithms that are run. There are ordinary least square, there's root mean squared errors, um, there's a mixture of um, KNN algorithms, there's a mixture of clustering algorithms, and pattern recognition algorithms. There's all kind of unique algorithms that could potentially run in each one of the neurons in order to generate the output, whatever that output might be. And the reason why we call it like, like a black box is because each neuron has its own specific function of taking the data, crunching some numbers, and doing something with that data. So with that being the case, uh, neural networks can pretty much be modeled for both supervised and unsupervised learning in, in the machine learning world. It's used with web searches, it's used with speech recognition and object recognition, and it's used with language translations, and so on and so forth. So all of that can be done with the neural network. All right, the next here we want to talk about is, this is all great understanding the different approaches for machine learning algorithms, but how do we implement it inside of code? Well, to be honest, if you didn't have a library to help you, you pretty much need to be a data scientist and I mean, you could use like some of the Excel formulas, but then the Excel formulas don't have any open source to it, so you don't really see what the mathematical algorithms are about. So you wind up having to study a little bit about math to figure out what the KNN algorithm is, what the C5.0 algorithm is, right? You have to read about what these mathematical names are to figure out what the math is behind it, and then you'd have to translate that math into code. Right, so that's one way you could do it, and that's why I say you basically need to be a data scientist or have a PhD in math to really comprehend what's going on. Or you can use the more simpler approaches. So one of the other simpler approaches would be using a library called NCOG, NCOG.net. One of the leading data scientists slash computer uh, developers that are out there that have created really kind of one of the founders of neural networks and neural network designs created this library called NCOG. His name is uh, Dr. Heaton and you can find him at uh, Dr. Heaton Research, I believe, org. I have a link to it at the end of the slides here. And he has a library that works with C++, Python, that should say Ruby, not Rooney, Ruby, uh, and .NET. And you can call into those libraries and they have a lot of mathematical algorithms for you to use if you want to incorporate that. If you want to kind of break out and really understand the math and science behind it all, you can you can play or act like a potential data scientist and open up Excel or open up the language that most data scientists use called R. So here I have an example of how we might use R. So here is a program called RStudio, which you can download from, um, if you Google RStudio, we'll pull up the link to that. Again, I have a link to the URL inside the slides as well. And within RStudio, RStudio runs on top of multiple platforms. So you can run it in Linux, you can run it on a Mac, you can run it on Windows, um, and you can, and it works with the R language. The R language is itself its own engine that you have to download from uh, the R website and that engine is a very easy engine to work with. So the easiest way to understand the R is to kind of work with some data here. So let me first set my working directory to a folder that has all of my Excel files, and I believe that's going to be my 
downloads our learning folder. Okay, and let me first open up an Excel file and just kind of kind of talk my way through some of the data that's here. Sorry about that. All right, so let's say let's take a look at uh, this credit file. So here in this Excel file, I have a checking balance column, I have a month's loan duration column, a credit history, a purpose, an amount, savings, employment, and notice the data here is different forms of data. Some of these have funny characters, some of these have numbers, some of these have letters, more numbers, and so on and so forth. I can read this data inside of R fairly easily by uh, using a variable. So let's say I have a credit variable. I don't know if you guys can see the screen very well. I don't think I can zoom in per se. Actually, before I get into this, let me stop right there and ask, did any of you guys have any questions uh, that you'd like to type in into the chat window? I'm looking at the chat window now. Thank you, looking great so far, very good, thank you very much. Okay, very good. So let's go back to the Art Studio demo here. So let's say I have a credit variable. So first thing you'll notice here is that the syntax is a little bit different. So normally in most programming language to create a variable you usually declare it with some type of keyword such as var or you know whatever it is, string, and so on and so forth. Well in this case we don't really have data types like that inside of the R language. You just kind of name it and then we normally in programming languages you use the equals assignment to set it to some value. The equals assignment works here but that's not really what we do. When we're working with R, R looks at everything like very similar to like constants and vectors. So if you're not familiar with what a vector is, a vector is nothing but a row of information, right? It's just a row that has all your data, right? It has you know all the columns of the information, and typically vectors have the same data type. Um, when Whenever you need a row of data that has different columns that have different data types, that's typically what we refer to as a table, a table with one row. So that's kind of the idea of what we're doing here. So we're working with vectors and tables or uh, data tables as they're referred to inside of the, the R language. So let's say I want to read that whole Excel spreadsheet in as a data table variable. What I do is I use the read.csv command and then I'll pass in a pointer to that file and I already forgot the name of that file. It was called credit.csv. Credit.csv. And passing that in, it reads, as long as that file is a valid comma separated value file and it's not missing any, it's not missing any commas basically and everything looks good, is you know, you can open it up in Excel and it looks good, it'll pretty much read. You know, you can have jagged values as long as you have commas with blank values. If you have one less comma or two or three invalid commas, then it won't read properly. And what you could do here is you can use the STR, which stands for the structure command, to see the structure of that variable. And what you can see here is you can see all kind of cool information. You can see it's declared as a data frame of 100 observations with 17 variables. So that's the terminology of saying we have 1,000 records and 17 columns. Right? So that's what this is meaning. This means, and it shows you what each column, because they're named inside the Excel file, with the very first row in the Excel having the, the column names. It could tell us here that, you know, you can see that the amount is an integer. It discerned that or it figured that out. It can see here that the credit checking balance is what we refer to in something in R called a factor, meaning it's a string that can have multiple values, but these values 
have only four distinct string values, believe it or not. So that's what it just means that we can read the, the factors out as strings if you want them as a string, or it can do even more processing and go, well, out of all of these strings, you really only have four unique values. So maybe this is not really a string, but maybe this is really a character that has like an enumeration of four different possible values, in lack of a better word. Right, so we can do things like that, and, and we can do other things with this as well. So let's say that, okay, well, this is all fine and dandy, but within all of this data, let's say I only want to pay attention to um, the amount. So I can create another variable here and set that equal to the credit variable and pass in the credit dollar amount. I believe this is the code to do this here. And, oh, I did that wrong. Let's just do it this way. Let's just set it to credit amount. There we go. Now when I look at the credit amount information now being stored in the amount variable, it tells me it's just a basically one vector of integer numbers between 1 and 1,000. So the cool thing about this is that we can then take a report on this and take a look at a plot. Well, let's take a look at the histogram of the amount using the hist function. And this shows me now within that list what the highest value is, what the lowest value is, and gives me a histogram of out of all of the different um, values, you know, the frequencies of values that that are 400, the frequencies that are 300, the frequencies that are 100, and so on and so forth. I can also take this amount and plot it against, let's say, the credit history. So to do that, I can use the plot command, and I can say I want to plot the credit dollar, what did I just say, credit history, I think that's what I just said, credit history against the amounts, and because these columns have the same amount of records, this plot will work just fine, and so here you can see that we have the um, credit history which is based off of strings, critical, good, perfect, poor, and very good. And you can see the amount, which is a number. And so here again, you can just see this reporting mechanism, or this fairly quick reporting mechanism based off of that data. So with R, you can really graphically see the data as you process it. You can run it through different algorithms. And by the way, to get different algorithms, let me go up here to the top window up here. This is a saved example um, that uses data that's coming from one of the devices I have in order to detect um, the heart rate. And, you know, we could talk about that, but that's neither here or there for this particular session. But the idea being is that if we want to load up different libraries, mathematical libraries that exist, we basically use the install packages command. And the install packages allows us to install different type of packages, such as the Jade package for joint diagonal um, uh, matrices, uh, we have the signal package for doing signal processing, we can use the MATLAB package, um, we have a bunch of different mathematical formulas that we can use, and some of those packages are freely available, well all of the packages, I'm sorry, are freely available, and some of them even provide the source code that you can open up and look and see what the math is behind um, these packages. So you install the package, you load the package, and then you use it. And and to understand how to use the package, you just do dollar sign, I mean, you do question mark the name of the package, and it'll pull up a help screen, um, which is all web-based. It allows you to read what parameters you need to pass in, how you need to set it up, and the output that you get back. All right, so enough about the R demo, because I can go on and on about this, and that's, again, not the key. The idea being here is that most data scientists and developers, such as yourself, could utilize RStudio to play around with test, look at the source code, look at the open source, figure out exactly what the mathematical algorithms are in order to manipulate the data that's coming from a particular device. So that takes us to this next topic, introducing you to mammals. Well, okay, not exactly 
those mammals, but this mammal, Microsoft Azure Machine Learning. So Microsoft Azure Machine Learning, let me open up a browser to my instance of Azure Machine Learning, is a way for you to do the same thing we can do in our studio, but now we have a much more graphical approach as to what's happening, and not only can we um, do everything we can do pretty much in our studio, but it now allows you to take existing R Studio and Python mathematical algorithms that already exist and load them up in here as well. So it first starts off with an experiment environment, and let's go ahead and create a new environment to step you through that process. And we'll start with a new blank experiment, and it gives you a nice little graphical view. For those that are coming from a biz talk space or a workflow space, it looks a lot like a, a web-based workflow editor. Hmm wonder where they got that idea from. In any case, what the first thing it allows you to do is say, okay, let's say I have a data set. I need to get the data from somewhere. So where am I going to get the data from? Well, you can upload data sets such as Excel files, such as my credit Excel file and other Excel files that you have or CSV files, or you can pull the data from SQL, SQL blob storage. You can even pull the data from um, event, um, event Hub. Uh, utilizing you know this window here and pull it in here and read the data and do stuff with it. So first thing you do is you drag the data over to your window and once you drag that data over you can even see the data, you can re-download the data, um, you could generate the data access rest code for C Sharp and Python languages if you wanted to get to that, that data. But once we have that data, the next step is is to then now start thinking about what you want to do, right? In this case, it's an experiment environment, so maybe there are all kinds of different things that you want to do. So the next thing we're going to do once we have that data, come back over here, is maybe you, so one of the things I didn't talk about with machine learning is the way in which we train or teach the, the computer algorithms that we want to use is we have to train the data. And sometimes the data you get is not clean. So sometimes you have to manipulate the data. If you're coming from a BizTalk world, that means you're going to have to transform the data and map the data and do all kind of interesting stuff to the information. So with that being the case, you might want to come over here and take a look at data transformation and filter data. You might want to uh, split the data um, so that if you have a thousand rows, maybe you don't want to train off of the whole thousand rows, and typically you don't. Typically you train off of 60% of the data or 70% of the data, and the way you do that is you would come over here, and you could drag a split here, and then link the dots, and you could say here I want to split at 70%, where this is 70% over here, and this is 30% of the data. All right, so once I've split the data, what I might want to do is take this 70% as training data and this 30% as uh, the actual real-life test re result that I want to use. All right, so after we have split the data, the next thing we might want to do is we might want to figure out some algorithms. So if you open up the machine learning here, we have the evaluate phase, we have uh, the scoring phase, which is done toward the end of the process. Um, we have different type of things that we may choose to utilize. We have the initialized model phase. So remember how we talked about the different types or different approaches to machine learning? Well, they're right here inside of Azure Machine Learning. We have classification. Classification is this idea where we're trying to determine using like nearest neighbor algorithms and we're trying to figure out how things are grouped together. So we have different ways of doing that. We have clustering, which is very similar to difference between classification and clustering. Typically clustering is all about unsupervised learning, whereas classification is about supervised. So it means you have previous history and you have the output based off of that previous history, where unsupervised is you don't have any previous history and you just want to figure out what things look alike, right? What columns, what features can be grouped together because they behave the same way or their values look similar in some form or fashion, such as when column, when the features of 
of height, when a person gets taller over the years, they also get, or let's put it another way, when a person gets shorter through the years, you know, in, in millimeters or whatever, they may also get fatter, right? They may also weigh more, something like that, right? You can kind of determine those things by utilizing um, clustering, right? You could determine these type of information by feeding it through a clustering algorithm. You might have anomaly detection, uh, you might have regression, and we have different forms of regression, um, and so on and so forth. So typically, if you have a question that you want to ask, such as in the credit file, I want to find out when should a person have a loan approved. You might want to use something that receives um, a decision tree, because a decision tree is yes and no, especially if it's loans. So here, let's say we want to use the boosted decision tree. So I'll drag that over here as a uh, model that I'd like to use. Let's come over here. So then what I need to do is bring down a training model and say that the model I want to train is the boosted decision tree. And I want to train it off of 70% of the data. And then once it's trained, I want to score it and see how well a particular item did. So, oops. So I'll do it like that, and I'll take this down here like this. All right. So now with the training model, the training model needs to know, okay, well, out of this credit data, what feature should it train off of? What is the column or one or more columns that give me the output that I need to train from, from the historical data? So that's what this little exclamation mark is basically telling me. It's asking me to select that column. And because we're using a boosted decision tree, that's just going to give me um, a yes or a no, basically, a zero or a one. It lets me know, yes, it's true. We should approve. No, it's false. We shouldn't approve. Right? So we come over here to the train model. We can select the column that we want. And the column here, let's say, the column in this particular data is called the default column. Do they have they defaulted on the loan or not? And that's pretty much it. So I've, you know, I've used this one model, but again, I can use as many models as I want by just simply coming over to the initialize model and choosing one of the patterns that I'd like to use, dragging it over here and putting it in and substituting it here for this this particular section into the train model. So once I've done that, what I want to do is I want to save it, and then I want to test it by clicking on run. So run is actually going to take the data, feed it into the split, it's going to split it 70-30, it's going to take the boosted decision tree mathematical algorithm, and it's going to figure out the coefficients on how to determine if a person should default on, if this process should default on the loan based off the historical data. So based off the 1,000 records, it's going to take 700 and figure out what's the best outcome to figure out if a person defaults on their loan or not, and then, and then score it. Based off of the 300 records that are left, it's going to run it and test it against that. So then, once I have the scored data set, I can visualize it and see what the results are. And here, you can see the actual records. And if I scroll all the way over, you can see that this is the actual defaulted value of the historical data. And scroll this down here. And it shows me that out of the defaulted ones, we had 200 that defaulted and 80 of them. Well, that can't be right. I thought it was a thousand records. All oh, these are in bins. Okay. So bins mean basically every ten samples. So this out of a thousand, it's telling me that eight hundred nope, that's not right. Okay, I'm not reading this correctly. But anyway, the idea here is that it tells me if I can scroll over some more here. It tells me what the default value was, and it tells me a number here. It actually tells me what the predicted default value was here. I'm not something I'm not showing here. 
score data set be the output log. Credit history, purpose, amount, savings balance, percent of income. Okay. Um, if I remember correctly, because I, I thought last time I did this, I had a predicted default here, but I think I used a different CSV file. But in any case, the score labels winds up being a number between 0 and 1. Um, the negative doesn't matter. Just look at it as the absolute value. Between 0 to 1, 0 meaning no, and 1 being yes, um, that that person may have defaulted. So this winds up being a percentage between 0 to 1 that allows you to say, okay, yeah, this person most likely will default uh, going forward. So here you could see what the real value is and what the predicted values are appropriately. So here you can see that some of them are not quite correct, as you can see here and here, whereas the others seem to be spot on, as this one. So sometimes when you have these machine learning algorithms and you apply them, you don't get the exact results. You don't get, you know, there's an error. There's an error margin that you have to work with. So machine learning is a lot of trial and error. And when you don't get the, you're never going to get 100%. As a matter of fact, most machine learning algorithms, you can probably get maybe, if you're lucky, anywhere in the, the high, anywhere in the low 90s. You might get 90% right. You might get 89% right. And those are really good algorithms. Most of the time, you're going to get anywhere from 80 to 85%. And just using different optimization features and tactics, um, a lot of times 80 to 85 percent is pretty good depending on the industry or the topic that you're working with. All right, so let me bounce back over to the slides here for a second and drill into um, utilizing the device. So let's say you have a device that generates a lot of data. Let's say you have a device like the Connect for Windows device. The Connect for Windows is a device that has four sensors, which means that you're going to get a lot of data from these four sensors. You're going to get color, infrared, depth, and microphone data. That's going to give you a lot of data. And if you know anything about the Connect device, it generates 30 frames per second. So 30 frames a second, a frame is, in the case of color, a frame is a 1080p pixel range because it's actually an HD camera. So think of one frame being um, 1,080 um, rows by 1,440 uh, columns. That, that's how you want to look at it, right? It's a lot of data. And for each pixel, you're going to get that 30 times a second. For IR, you're not going to get as much information. For audio, you're going to get a lot of signal information. So this is a lot of data that you're going to get from the Connect device. Let me give you a live example of information that you can see from the Connect device. So here's an application called Connect Evolution. And if I kind of scroll back here, you can see the waves, the sound waves that are being displayed here. As I move, it follows me as to the location of where the microphone or where the sound is coming from. Here we have a depth cloud. We can even switch over to the block man. If you can see me, I can stand up. It can't quite get my legs here, but if I move my arms, it's getting the joint rotations, the head rotations, right? All of this is data that's coming from the connect device. And with all of this data, see if I can switch to uh, color here. There's black and white. Here I am. Hi. Right. All of this data can be saved and read into a spreadsheet. And as you save and read that data into the spreadsheet, you can run algorithms across it and integrate that with Azure Machine Learning to, again, detect patterns of data and determine all kind of interesting, cool tricks. So if you have a device such as an elevator or a refrigerator and, or you know, a thermostat, and you have a way by means of physically attaching um, maybe a Raspberry Pi to it to send data up to the internet, 
the steps that it would take for you to detect the data patterns is to want, number one, understand the data that's coming from it. Understand if it's events that are taking place, then you might use uh, event streams. If it's um, just telemetry data, you know, such as the location of the information, the temperature of the information, right? You're just going to record that at certain timestamps. So you're going to keep recording that information. So you need to record that data into some type of record, and some type of spreadsheet, to some type of database. So that's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is, as an analytical part of it, you use Azure Machine Learning and build test beds and experiments to figure out what can you learn from that, from the different mathematical algorithms that exist. The next thing you would do is you expose that machine learning. Once you've figured out the analytical side of it, you expose that machine learning, which I didn't show you that aspect of it, but that's really easy to do. You come over here and you click on prepare as web service, and what it does is it adds a, a web service input and a web service output to your overall algorithm, and as long as the input has the same type of columns of data that your credit CSV has, then this branch will run, and of course you don't need the train model and the decision, you don't need the train model, you still need, uh, I'm sorry, you don't need to train the data and split the data anymore because in reality, once you've figured out, once the model has been trained, that's it. It's just going to continue running down that path. Um, you have the ability of using the input and output of the web service to generate whatever the output is that you're looking for. And we have two forms of that web service input output. You could send data in as a batch or you could send one record in as a time. And based off of all the columns in that record, it will determine you know, the output or predict the output if you're looking for a predictive analysis. All right. Let's go back. So once you have exposed that web service, then you can make calls into that web service with any .NET application that you want, including Windows 10 applications, uh, to make it really unique and really nice. So coming to a conclusion here, as a developer, your overall process is to identify the device and use one of the cool tricks within IoT to get that data, be it events or telemetry data, into the cloud maybe connecting it up to a physical device such as Raspberry Pi, or maybe the device itself already has internet capability. Then, and once you have that information, once you have that events and that data, you can um, you could then apply it or send it and save it up into the storage using either SQL databases, blob storage, DocDBs, um, and then, or an Excel spreadsheet if you are working with it on your local dev machine. And then you can use different forms of analysts uh, analysis in order to figure out what mathematical algorithms. I just showed you Azure Machine Learning, but you also have Stream Analytics, you also have HD Insight, Data Warehouse. Now, of course, those other three I've mentioned have different unique aspects of it. Machine Learning is the idea of you save the data out, you want to run multiple tests on it, so it's kind of like a save, figure out what you're doing, and then publish it model, where stream analytics is, okay, you already know what you're doing, you already know the data, this is live data that's being streamed through, you just want to interact with it right now, and then you want to forecast on it using queries on the live data right now, so that's the idea of stream analytics, and HD Insight is kind of like uh, the big warehousing, big data warehousing approach, where you have, um, you know, you have big big terabytes of data and you need to uh, run queries over those terabytes of data to forecast and do uh, analyzing information. They So the, the different products here serve different purposes, but the idea is the same. You analyze the data in some form or fashion, you run some query over it, and then you can get some output. And then from that, you could basically, all of these expose web services in some form or fashion. So that means that you could take the presentation tier and build .NET apps against them um, because all of these .NET apps can call into web services. So that means app services, Power BI, notification hubs, mobile services, BizTalk services, you name it. If it's a web service, one of those pieces can integrate with it and you can do something with that data. So as a recap, again, reasons why you might want to use this recognizing data patterns, predicting actions and events, finding out what's going to happen before it actually happens based off of probabilities, based off of ratios of things that happened in the past, finding similar data, doing pattern recognition and clustering, 
in the case of unsupervised learning. Maybe you want to rank your information. Maybe you have a set of results and you need to figure out who's doing you know, the most popular search results. Again, you can rank it. Or maybe you just have an idea that you want to put together with these different ad hoc devices that are sitting in your garage somewhere and you need to plug them all together and you just want to see what you can create. Again, Azure Machine Learning provides a very beautiful environment to allow you to do that. So what are you guys to do going forward? Go to studio Azure Machine Learning .net, register, start playing with it. You'll need a Windows account, Windows Live account to sign on. Um, look into Windows 10 and take a look at the new IoT device layer or I should say the devices framework for Windows Embedded and Windows 10 apps. Um, I do a lot of uh, blogging on connect and devices. You can go to dgoings.wordpress.com and if you are in happen to ever be in the New York area, uh, we at Nimble would love to have you come by one of our Azure uh, meetup sessions. So you can go to nimble.com to find more information on that. And as references, um, I'll send this to Michael, I'll send this whole slide deck to Michael so he can have it and get it out to all the good folks there wherever you guys are in Europe. And basically these are references to the R project, to heat and research, to Azure Machine Learning, uh, and so on and so forth. All right. So with that, I hand it over to you. I thank you guys. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in and uh, I'll do my best to try and answer them. Awesome, that was really great. That thanks, Dwight. Um, I think we've, um, we've only got a couple of questions that have popped in there. I don't know if you've seen them already from Russ and Jasper. Okay, I'm reading them now.